Long ago, white storks nested on inaccessible cliffs in eastern and southwestern Europe, or in remote forests where giant trees were home to huge colonies. But only when man began to herd animals and to till the ground were storks able to move into Central Europe. Forests were cleared, opening up new feeding grounds. Human homes rising from the plains, a bit like boulders, offered new nesting sites. Thanks to humans, white storks had it made. Unlike other wild animals, they were never hunted. On the contrary, people saw them as bearers of good fortune. Over millennia, storks found ever new advantages in coexisting with man. Today, they've even gone urban and colonized the most unlikely locations. They've followed us further and further, even to the nastier places of our civilization. But familiar as they are to us, white storks are still wild animals. And their epic journeys from Europe to Africa and back are among the greatest spectacles of wild nature. This is the range of big animals. The savanna nurtures a profusion of wildlife. Big predators and countless herbivores. The savanna is also the home of one of the world's biggest birds, the marabou, a giant among the stork family. Half a million white storks come here to escape the cold while the northern hemisphere is caught in the grip of winter. In huge flocks, they hunt for food. In the dry season, bushfires sweep over vast stretches of land bringing a windfall for the birds. Insects flee the fire in masses. All a stork needs to do is pick the biggest and best. Although it's not always as easy as it seems. Originally, the white stork was a true African. Only at the end of the last ice age did storks begin to migrate to Europe to breed and exploit evolving opportunities. Meanwhile, the black and white birds spend the lesser part of the year in Africa. In January, just a few weeks after their arrival, they set off northward. Those groups who've spent the winter in South and East Africa now follow the Nile downstream. At the Gulf of Suez and the Bosphorus Strait, they cross the sea through a narrow air corridor. Then they fan out across Europe's wetlands in Central and Eastern Europe and as far north as the Baltic. The Western storks have spent the winter in the Sahel and beyond. As they cross the Straits of Gibraltar, they reach the Iberian Peninsula most of them stay here for the summer. Others move on to France and Germany. Twice a year, here at the Straits of Gibraltar, the migration of storks between Morocco and Spain is an impressive sight. In winter, 
and during their journeys, storks are more gregarious than at other times. Day after day, groups of several thousand glide over Spain's southernmost tip. The first ones to have made it can finally rest and eat after the long trip. Gradually, the huge flocks disband. Refreshed, they continue in smaller groups to their various breeding areas. Istanbul. For millennia, this has been the southeastern gateway to Europe. Like the Straits of Gibraltar, the Bosporus Strait is a major turntable of bird migration. Each spring, several hundred thousand storks crowd the airspace above the teeming metropolis. Huge swarms spiral upwards in thermal pillars, then glide northward over domes and minarets. Storks are gliders and need warm winds to lift them. Such upwinds only occur over land. Storks avoid long distance flights over water and cross the strait as quickly as they can. Driven by the urge to breed, the storks now make enormous mileage every day, up to 400 kilometers. The wetlands along the Sava River in Croatia act like a magnet. In the town of Chigoc, some 50 pairs regularly breed on wooden houses more than three centuries old. Its popularity with storks has earned Chigoc the official title of European Stork Village. One after another, the harbingers of spring arrive. The first to land are usually mature, experienced males. As their summer residence, these storks have chosen one of Europe's sleepier corners. In Chigoc, the clocks seem to be permanently slow. Like in olden times, herds are led to pasture. The swampy meadows near the town are a stork's paradise. In pools and ponds, the storks find more food than they can eat and there's no shortage of building material. The same spring scene is now enacted on all the rooftops. Everywhere, storks are checking, loosening up, and repairing their old nests. From the wetland forest, they carry roots, branches, and grass. Carefully, they work the material into the nests. Even a dead fish that isn't immediately eaten goes into construction. For storks, home improvement is a lifetime occupation. Whenever possible, they return to the same old structure, adding to its height year after year. A fresh cushion of moss and grass will ensure comfort.
This stuff's just right for the neighbor's home. His female partner, too, is ready to breed. If a pair doesn't keep a watchful eye on their home, their efforts could be wasted in no time at all. Nothing is safe from keen home-building neighbors. The very minute both male and female have arrived, the courtship begins. The joint balancing act only lasts 20 seconds, but is repeated 10 times a day for two weeks. Now winter is really over. It's spring, time for new life to arrive. It's not without reason that many cultures believe storks deliver babies. The storks that settle in Chigoch are only a small percentage of those that migrate much further north. This is a very special refuge for storks, a sprawling wetland area along the River Mach, straddling the Austrian-Slovakian border. When in early spring, these floodplains are inundated for several weeks, the storks can count on a good year. Many fish use the inundated plains as their spawning grounds. Their young will feed the young of the storks. Marheg in Austria is also a European stork village, but here the birds have their nests in huge trees, just like in ancient days. Some of these giant oaks hold up to eight nests. The biggest ones are two meters high and weigh close to a ton. The highest level is the most desirable, offering a splendid overview and effective protection against predators. Year after year, in late March, each stork returns to its very own nest, unless a better opportunity is opened up. For good nesting sites, competition is tough. The intruder is not impressed by clattering or other threatening gestures. Such conflicts can end fatally. When it comes to defending their nests, the rightful owners can be extremely forceful. A stork's bill is a formidable weapon. It can cause deep cuts and victims sometimes bleed to death. Other nests are more peaceful. Finally, he arrives. She has been waiting long enough. This type of clatter is a joyful greeting. Storks do not waste much time with courtship. They quickly come to the point. Storks have a reputation of being faithful partners 
but their relationship is more of a joint ownership. Although they do often return with the same partner, it's really the nesting site they return to, even if a partner is lost. The colony has now filled up with storks. Almost all the nests are occupied. Immediately after mating, the females have laid their eggs. Within a week, there are three to four eggs. To optimize the growth of the embryos, each egg must be turned over several times a day. Some five weeks later, the chicks will hatch. Male and female share the burden of sitting on the clutch. They take turns several times a day so that each can leave to feed. In mid-May, the first chicks hatch. Three tiny feathery balls have already escaped their eggshells. And now, even the youngest shows signs of life. With its egg tooth, a tiny pointed tip at the front of the bill, the chick has chiseled a hole through the shell. Hatching is tedious. Some chicks pick away for more than a day to free themselves. The parents watch nervously, getting up more often than usually and poking around the nest. The chick has almost made it. Just one last big push, and it will be united with its siblings. Free at last. When the chicks hatch, they weigh hardly 80 grams but they put on new weight every day. What they now need most is warmth and safety under their parents' wings. How many chicks will make it to adulthood depends on this year's food supply. If the river floods a second time in late spring, chances are that the entire clutch will eventually be flying. Black storks, too, have colonized the wetland forest. They are shy and have always been much rarer than their white cousins. Jungle-like foliage offers protection to many different animals. For the sensitive black storks, this place is perfect. They need the quiet of vast, mature forests. One single disturbance may be enough for them to abandon their nest for good. Beavers, too, have reclaimed the Mach wetlands. Beavers had been declared extinct in Austria more than a century ago. Then, in the mid-80s, some 30 individuals were released in this very area. Meanwhile, they've been joined by migrants from Germany and Eastern Europe. The European beaver's comeback has been truly sensational. But the storks also have dangerous neighbors. Martins relish bird's eggs of any sort, but getting a stork egg is not easy. Getting up there is not the problem. Both stone and pine martins are excellent climbers. In the dark, the storks can't see the martin, but they sense danger and are alert. The birds warn the intruder off with hissing noises and wing beating. But what happens then really drives the martin off. A 
a summer solstice celebration. The stalks seem unruffled by the fireworks. Wildlife in these wetland forests is used to human neighbors. The celebration ends with a fleet of paper lanterns sailing downstream, a symbol of friendship between the peoples of this border region. Then the usual silence returns to the River Mach. In Spain, it's silence that is unusual. Austrian storks may be kept awake one night a year. Spanish storks have learned to put up with noisy people all the time. Storks in Extremadura couldn't live closer to humans. 130 pairs reside on the rooftops of Malpartida de Cáceres. Some 40 families nest on the church roof alone. Spain boasts Western Europe's largest stork population, even though not long ago the situation was worrying. Today, their numbers are soaring again, to an estimated 40,000 breeding pairs. Los Baruecos, an archaic bold escape right next to the stork town. Huge granite rocks offer safe nesting sites. The place seems to echo a distant past in the stork's land of origin, Africa. The vast grassy fields are a paradise for white storks. Wherever grazing herds are free to roam, the land is ideal for storks. Livestock keeps the grass short, and the local birds know that following the herds is an easy way to find sustenance. In Spain, there seems to be hardly a place where storks do not feel at home. They seem to enjoy the company of hundreds of egrets and to have a fable for historic roosts. Spain's white storks are masters of adaptation. They have conquered just about every niche suitable for nesting. For storks in Spain, there seems to be no wrong side of the railway tracks. For the feathery residents of Cáceres, traffic noise is part of life. Merida's Roman aqueduct, a perfect nesting site with a view. The palace grounds of Eguijuelas have attracted an entire colony. Even occupy the antennas of a Spanish broadcasting corporation. High voltage lines are also inviting, but they are risky. Every year, numerous storks lose their lives. But these dangers are outweighed by the advantages of living with mankind.
Alfaro, in the province of La Rioja, offers one of the best examples of the recovery of storks in Spain. In the 1980s, the population had sunk to a low of just 10 pairs. A decade later, their presence had again risen to 130 pairs. Today, the Cathedral of San Miguel alone boasts 140 nests. With an average of five head per family, the cathedral roof is home for 700 individuals. Now, prime real estate is getting scarce. Each little ledge or turret is used as a foundation, and each year the number of nests is growing. This is one of the world's largest stork colonies, right on the main square of a Spanish provincial town. The inhabitants of Alfaro love their summer guests. San Miguel without the clattering? Unthinkable. Come July, the youngsters can no longer sit still. They're almost two months old now and strong enough for their first flight. The cathedral roof has become a flying school. Joint wing beating builds fitness. A first encouraging success, hovering for a few seconds above the siblings' heads. Another try. And another. Take off for the maiden flight, the biggest moment of growing up. During these days, one youngster after another leaves the safety of the nest. In no time at all, they learn the trick. Soon, they rival their parents in elegance. Way north in Austria, the chicks are still sitting in their nests. Although they've gained some weight, they are far behind their Spanish cousins. In Central Europe's colder climate, the breeding season begins later and the young storks also leave their nests at a later time. Until then, the parents need to bring lots more insects, frogs, fish and mice. Sometimes there's a little help from an unexpected side. Meals on wheels. Farmers here cut the grass to a perfect length, chasing up much of the life on the ground, an easy meal for the storks.
to the Marhead colony, this assistance is vital. There is no hunting in high grass. The food supply around the colony is decisive for the stork's breeding success. Although white storks are long-distance commuters, during the breeding season they don't venture further than seven kilometers from their nests. The freshly cut meadows right below the colony come in very handy. Whatever fits into a bill is carried off. The storks need to keep their nests in good shape throughout the summer. Others carry loads of food. The begging motions of the youngsters cause the parents to regurgitate their load. There is no individual feeding. The chicks simply grab what they can. The ones that have hatched first are usually the strongest and can get more food. A stork family of three youngsters consumes about four kilos of food per day, keeping the parents busy all the time. A grass snake would be perfect. Take aim. Thrust. Hold it tight. Down the hatch and off for home. A nest full of young storks is like a bottomless pit. Whatever you feed them, it's never enough. A bigger catch will keep them quiet for a little while. The mother has brought several snakes at once. This will keep them busy. It's hard work to eat a snake. There's no way to tear it up. This tug of war is serious, and the winner takes it all. Get a good grip and rip the other end from the opponent's throat. That'll do the trick. The youngsters in the neighboring nest are full, but they too have a problem, the scorching summer heat. Both parents have flown. Their brood is directly exposed to the sun. Panting cools them down a bit, but it dehydrates the body. So the parents must bring water to the nest several times a day. Ah. 
the youngsters get so excited that the parents find it hard to land or stand on the nest. Water at last. But not enough. In the nest next door, the youngsters are luckier. Getting showered is a real luxury. If no water is delivered, at least some shade can be expected. Although white storks suffer when the weather is clammy, extreme heat is even worse for the young. A two-meter wingspan is exactly what's wanted now, even though the young have to move around to stay in the shade. sunny Spain, summer storms bring relief to the chicks. The wet birds don't exactly look happy, although they do need a shower. Their feathers are no longer white, but grey with dust. For a white stalk, this colour is unusual, but there is a reason behind it. The ruffling of feathers, preening and drying after the rain are vital. And then they're ready to go off and get dirty again. Over the years, the storks have identified the best food sources in the area. In Spain, wherever there are vultures, storks are not far away. Conservationists have established a network of feeding places for vultures across the Iberian Peninsula to help endangered populations. The vulture protection program has proved an enormous success and not just for vultures. Here, storks can take their pick without the trouble of hunting. This food source is regular and reliable. No wonder that the number of storks has risen dramatically. In comparison, being a stork in Austria is hard work. Meanwhile, the Austrian youngsters too have learned to fly and to fend for themselves. Only their landing skills need some improvement. Wrong nest. Belly landing. No nest at all. Crash landing. The youngsters will not be frustrated. They're getting better every day, and they need to. Their first departure to Africa is quickly approaching. In Croatia's Chigoc, the chicks have also grown into big teenagers. 
In the Sava wetlands, the breeding success is generally high, so the nests begin to feel crowded. Only when food is abundant are stork parents able to raise so many chicks. The Sava floodplains offer a wealth of opportunities. Chigoch is part of the Lonchkopolye nature park, where traditional agriculture prevails and ancient domestic breeds survive. Chigoch village borders on sprawling pastures. The cattle that graze here groom the land in a natural way. For the storks, these herds prepare the ground in the same manner as do the vast wildebeest and zebra herds in the Serengeti. As they graze, they drive before the millions of insects for the storks to catch. Turapolia pigs make a contribution by wallowing and creating deep puddles that soon fill with tadpoles, another feast for the storks. Few domestic breeds are suitable for swamplands, but the robust Posavina is the traditional workhorse in this region. For centuries, these horses have worked with man. Once they pulled Europe's tramways, but now even their place in agriculture has been lost to mechanization. but they still have one important task, keeping the Sava wetlands clear from encroaching woods and ensuring access to food resources for a great variety of wetland birds. For the storks, the idyll is perfect. In Spain's Extremadura, idil has a different meaning. Each morning, huge numbers of storks congregate at a waste dump. Urban dumps seem to be a greater attraction than all the wetlands combined. Here, the storks act like vultures. Thousands of them fly in every day to pick edibles from the human refuse. If they're lucky, there's more to take away than kitchen waste. Naturally, a place like this is infested with rats. But rats are clever. Waste offers not just food, but also perfect hideaways. Waste recycling is the true cause behind the sensational comeback of a once threatened species. Meanwhile, Spain's waste dumps have become so popular with storks that many birds have even stopped migrating to Africa. These stork restaurants are open all year round, even during the cold season. It's certainly easier to commute between a roost and a nearby never-ending food source than to fly thousands of kilometers every year. Whoever wants to fly south anyway must get ready now. Autumn is near. Gibraltar in late August. At their narrowest, the Straits of Gibraltar are only 14 kilometers wide.
Africa looks so close, but for the storks, it is still out of reach. Flocks of hundreds of animals have arrived from all over Western Europe and are gathering near the coast. For days, they have been grounded here. The birds need exactly the right wind conditions to first be elevated to sufficient height and then to safely glide across the straits. As long as wind speed and direction are not perfect, they have to wait. At last, the weather is right. One after the other, they soar upwards. Now, there is no holding back. One last curve above the rice fields of Andalusia. Half a year will pass until they land again on these green fields. It is as if Africa were calling to the birds. The coastal range is a last threshold to cross. Then the sea spreads out underneath. On some days in late summer, the skies above the beaches of southern Spain are crowded with thousands of storks. They have reached their ideal traveling height. Now they are only minutes away from their destination. The greater part of these flocks are first-time migrants. White storks are not taught their migration route by their parents. An inner compass directs them to their winter quarters. Most of these young storks will spend several years in Africa and only return to Europe when they are sexually mature. But the adults will be back in a few months. And again, they will usher in the spring and, with good luck, more babies.